Good morning. I'm so thankful that you could join us for our time of worship today. Let's begin by bowing before our Lord together. God, thank you so much for this special day of worship where we can hear your word preached, where we can sing from our hearts and with our hands and with our lips uh, the wondrous works that you've done and of your great character. Lord, help us to have our hearts be uh, opened up to what your spirit would teach us today and help us as we carry all the baggage from this week into our time of worship that we would um, not hold on to uh, areas of our hearts that, that you convict us of, but instead that we would be willing to turn and repent where repentance is necessary and that our hearts would be filled with joy as we praise you and are surrendered to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's sing together. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's great. I just, uh, man, I love the songs that we sang this morning. Really God-exalting, and I hope it prepared your heart to receive God's word. Would you join me as we look to the Lord together in prayer? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the privilege we have of knowing you and serving you and worshiping you. We thank you for caring for us and for saving us and for loving us. We pray this morning that you would use your word to affect our hearts, help us to see you more clearly, to understand you more accurately, and to follow you more passionately as a result of what the Spirit of God does in our hearts through your word. So use this time to accomplish your purpose in and among us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Good. Well, hopefully you have a Bible handy, and I would encourage you to take that and to go ahead and open your uh, Bible to Acts 19, Acts chapter 19. We began looking at this passage of Scripture, um, verses 1 through 20, last week. And this morning, we pick up again where we left off. In Acts 19, 1 through 20, Luke gives a brief summary of Paul's very diverse three-year ministry in Ephesus. And he does this through short vignettes or stories. Each one of these scenes highlights a unique aspect of the powerful work of God during this transitional period of the church. Last week in verses 1 through 7, we saw that through the ministry of His Spirit, the Lord baptizes believers into the church. Well, this morning, as we come to verses 8 through 20, we will look at three additional scenes during Paul's ministry in Ephesus. <clears throat> now, in the ancient world, Ephesus was world famous for its temple of the fertility goddess called um, Artemis. She's also called Diana in the Roman language, the Latin, and we'll see that later on in this chapter. This temple, which housed Artemis's image, was over twice the size of the Parthenon that was in Athens, making, making this temple, the Temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Well, who was Artemis or Diana? Who was she? In ancient mythology, Artemis was the goddess of the earth. And because it was believed that she controlled human reproductive powers, the worship of Artemis was overtly sexual and included ceremonial prostitution. When Paul, therefore, arrived in Ephesus, the city was in the grip of darkness. Because the Ephesians believed that evil spirits were responsible for everything bad that happened in life, the black arts permeated life in Ephesus. Magicians and necromancers and soothsayers were employed by people to keep those spirits at bay. Because of so much pagan worship and sexual promiscuity and superstition, Spiritual darkness really just sort of engulfed the entire city of Ephesus. Paul later explained to the believers in that city that they were actually in a spiritual war with the forces of darkness. However, Paul also reminded them that the way believers are to stand against those forces is by being strong in the Lord By putting on the armor of God. He wrote in Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against, notice this, the cosmic powers over this present darkness 
against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So Paul was telling these Ephesians who were very familiar with the spiritual forces of evil, he was telling them that the only way that we are to wage war against these forces is by remaining strong and standing firm in the Lord by taking on the whole armor of God. It was also during Paul's time in Ephesus that he wrote his first and second letters to the Corinthian church about the weapons of spiritual warfare. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4, Paul said, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, they're not physical, but have divine power, these, these weapons of our warfare have divine power to destroy strongholds. You see, Ephesus was a stronghold of darkness that would only be overcome by Christ. In verses 8 through 20, Luke shows how these strongholds in Ephesus were assaulted during Paul's ministry. It was through the proclamation of God's Word. It was through the power of His Spirit. And it was through the repentance of God's people. Now, the second vignette that we find uh, here in this section is in verses 8 through 10. Here we see that through the proclamation of His Word, the Lord instructs or informs or teaches people His truth. See, God's Word is the primary weapon that assaults the kingdom of darkness. How so? Through the power of the gospel, the lost are saved, and then through the power of truth, believers are edified and spiritually fortified and equipped for ministry. Now, in verses 8 through 10, we see two ways... God works through His Word. Notice first in verse 8 that God's Word reaches unbelievers through evangelism. Now, whenever Paul entered new territory, he always attempted to establish a beachhead among the Jews by evangelizing them first. Look at verse 8. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. Now, even though these Jews in Ephesus were not involved in the occult, they were just as controlled by Satan as were the Gentiles in Ephesus. You see, one of Satan's most effective strategies is to blind people to the truth by using religion. To keep unbelievers from seeing the light of the gospel, Satan's ministers appear as angels of light, and they function as wolves in sheep's clothing. In 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, Paul wrote, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. It's veiled to the lost. In their case, notice this, the God of this world, that's Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Why? For this purpose. To keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who's the image of God. You see, Paul had been invited by these Jews in Ephesus to stay with them and to teach them when he briefly stopped there at the end of his second missionary journey. Remember that? Well, now Paul is back. And his evangelistic efforts in the synagogue for three months were actually very effective because he was able to stay there and teach and evangelize for three months. Now notice the method of Paul's evangelism. In the 12 weeks that he was in the synagogue, Luke says that he spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. This was how Paul evangelized. He first boldly reasoned with unbelievers from the Scriptures. See, believing that the gospel was the power of God for salvation to the Jews first, 
This was how Paul approached evangelism in every synagogue he entered. As he entered, if you remember, in the synagogue in Thessalonica, Acts 17, verses 2 and 3 say this, And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, notice this, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. What did that involve? Well, Luke tells us, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ, the Messiah, to suffer and to rise from the dead. And saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Messiah. He is the Christ. This was Paul's method of evangelism. He boldly reasoned with unbelievers from the Scripture. But notice that he also passionately persuaded unbelievers from the Scriptures. For three months, Paul spoke boldly, reasoning, notice, and persuading them about the kingdom of God. That is, Paul passionately sought to convince these unbelieving Jews to believe the gospel, to trust in Jesus Christ. When Paul came to Rome toward the end of his ministry, Acts 28 verse 23 says that from morning till evening, notice what he did, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God, and get this, and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. So reasoning and persuading unbelievers from Scripture was Paul's method of evangelism. But notice Paul's message. He was seeking to persuade unbelievers about, Luke says, the kingdom of God. You see, Paul understood that the kingdom of God can only be entered into through the new birth. Jesus said in John 3, verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You see, it's through the new birth that unbelievers are transferred out of the kingdom of darkness, the domain of darkness, and then they are brought into the kingdom of Christ. That's why Paul says in Colossians 1.13, that he, that is Christ, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. You see, it's through the gospel of Jesus Christ that God breaks Satan's grip on unsaved people's hearts. That's why Paul proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom of God to these Jews. You see, they already believed from the Old Testament that Messiah would come and that he would overthrow other kingdoms and he would restore Israel to their land and then he would set up his righteous reign in Jerusalem from the throne of David. They already understood that. That was clear. However, what they didn't understand was that the Messiah had to first suffer and die in order to provide redemption for his people before he would come to reign. And so the message Paul proclaimed to them was that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah that God sent. But his own people rejected him and then crucified him on the cross. And if these Jews would repent and believe in him, then they would be born again. And they would be brought into the kingdom of God. And as we will see later, many Jews in Ephesus believed the gospel and were saved through Paul's evangelistic ministry. So what's the point that we can take away from this? It's that God's word reaches unbelievers through evangelism. But notice in verses 9 through 10, there's a second thing that God's word does. God's word, secondly, builds believers through discipleship. As Paul proclaimed the gospel, many Jews were receptive and actually became born-again followers of Christ. However, not everyone did. There were some who, after listening to Paul for three months, were fed up. That was about all that they could take because verse 9 says, But when some became stubborn, 
and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him. Now, the word stubborn here indicates that they had become hard. They had become stiff. They had become settled in their unbelief. See, that's one of the things that the gospel does. It will either humble proud hearts or it will harden those hearts. And so some in the synagogue became more obstinate and persistent in their unbelief after hearing the gospel over and over and over for three months. Now, I love it as a pastor when unbelievers come to countryside. But over the years, I've noticed that if they continue coming, over time, one of two things will inevitably happen. They will, one, either be drawn to Christ and become believers, or their hearts will become hard and they will leave. Why? Because becoming hardened to the truth actually creates a hatred for the truth and it creates a disdain for those who love the truth. Notice what these stubborn unbelievers whose hearts were hardened did. Luke says they were continually speaking evil of the way before the congregation. In other words, they were vilifying the Jews who had become Christians. So the climate now in the synagogue had become hostile and it became dangerous for those who had become Christians, these new believers. So what did Paul do? Luke says that Paul withdrew from them and took the disciples with him. In other words, he left the synagogue. But where did he go? Where did he and these young Christians go? Luke says they went to the hall of Tyrannus. Now, this would have been a lecture hall in Ephesus that they rented out during the hours when it wasn't in use. And since it was a, a public setting, it gave Paul a new opportunity to minister to Greeks as well as to Jews. And he was able to then disciple for two years those who were coming to Christ. Now, some manuscripts say that Paul did this daily from the fifth to the tenth hour. You may have a marginal note in your Bible that says that. This fifth to the tenth hour would have been from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. You see, in this region of the world, work was done from about 7 in the morning until um, 11 in the morning. Then, in the middle of the day, work shut down for a midday break until about 4 o'clock. And work then resumed until about 10 o'clock at night. So when Paul would have been teaching would have been during this 11 o'clock to 4 o'clock midday break. And verse 10 tells us that he did this for two years. That's a lot of ministry opportunity. That's a lot of discipleship. That's a lot of training that Paul did. But that wasn't the only time that Paul discipled these Ephesian believers. When he wasn't teaching publicly in the lecture hall, he personally discipled believers in their homes. In fact, in Acts 20, Paul reminded the elders in the Ephesian church of the spiritual investment that he had made in their lives when he ministered there. In Acts 20, verse 20, he said, You know how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public, that was the hall of Tyrannus, and from house to house. So Paul was a busy guy. And he was making tents, providing for his own living. He was teaching in the lecture hall of Tyrannus from 11 to 4. And then he was visiting people in their homes to disciple them. Could you imagine what it would have been like to be discipled by the Apostle Paul and to be able to sit under that kind of teaching ministry for, for two years? Well, what was the result of all this discipleship training that Paul was doing? Well, the result was that everyone in Asia Minor ended up hearing 
the gospel. Look at verse 10. So that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Now, does this mean that all the residents of Asia Minor came to Ephesus to the lecture hall to listen to Paul? No, absolutely not. Luke doesn't say Paul reached all of Asia. He says all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord. So how did they hear? Well, first, in Ephesus, Paul won people uh, to Christ. Then second, Paul discipled these Christians in the Scriptures. And then third, these disciples left Ephesus and preached the gospel all throughout Asia. You see, Paul operated on the principle of training faithful men who would then be able to train faithful men. This was actually 2 Timothy 2.2 in action. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, Timothy, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. See, God's plan is for believers to get saved, to then be trained, and trained believers then go out and train other believers. It was during this time, these two years in Ephesus, that men like Epaphras and Philemon planted the church that we know as the Colossian church, the church in Colossae. And it was when others like Trophimus and, and uh, Tychus uh, took the gospel to other cities in that region. It was very likely also during this time that the churches who are identified in, Rome, in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 were planted. See, this is God's plan for changing a world that's steeped in darkness. It's through spiritual reproduction. There is evangelism and discipleship. Evangelism and discipleship. And that cycle continues. Listen, God's word is the primary weapon that assaults the kingdom of darkness. The word reaches the lost through evangelism and it builds believers through discipleship. Now in verses 11 through 17, we come upon a third scene in Ephesus. Here we see that through the expressions of his power, the Lord validates the identity of his servants. Now, in our war against the kingdom of darkness, we not only need God's word, but we need God's power. In verses 11 through 17, we see three truths about God's power that unfolded in Ephesus. Let's look at them. First, God's power may sometimes be, be expressed by miracles. See, during Paul's ministry in Ephesus, the Lord made it crystal clear that Paul and the gospel that Paul proclaimed were from God. Look at verses 11 and 12. Luke says, And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. This was remarkable. Let me ask you a question. What are miracles? What are miracles? Well, miracles are expressions of God's power that occur outside of the natural laws that God has put in place. So by def definition, miracles are extraordinary acts of God, right? But notice that Luke says here that what God was doing through Paul was even more extraordinary than the average extraordinary miracle. I don't know how you get more extraordinary than a miracle that is extraordinary, but it happened here through Paul in Ephesus. Now notice the source of these miracles, I think it's very significant that Luke goes out of his way to say that God was doing the extraordinary miracles and not Paul. While they were obviously being done through Paul's hands, it was God who was doing these miracles. But notice that God wasn't just working through Paul's hands. 
He was also using Paul's handkerchiefs or aprons. The handkerchiefs would have been like the sweat rags that he wore around his head. And the aprons would have been the cloth that he put around his tunic to protect it from the work that he was doing. These items were taken to those who were sick. And Luke tells us that their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Now, what is this about? Was there power in these items, in these handkerchiefs, in these aprons? Were they magic? No. You remember in the Gospels, in Mark chapter 5, we, we learn about a woman who had an issue of blood. And what is amazing about this woman is that she was healed immediately just by touching the hem of Jesus' garment. Now, was it the hem of Jesus' robe that healed her? No, that fabric had no power whatsoever. It was the power of God who healed her, right? Well, in the same way, people in Ephesus were being healed and delivered from demons just by coming in contact with items of Paul's clothing. But it wasn't the pieces of clothing that healed them. It was God. See, an important truth is that God didn't need Paul's hands and he didn't need Paul's handkerchiefs in order to heal. So the question is, why did God choose to heal using Paul and these items that belong to him? We see this secondly in the significance of these miracles. Now, it's important for us to understand that while those who were sick and demon-possessed obviously benefited from these extraordinary miracles, the primary reason why God worked through Paul in this way was for a different purpose. Well, what was that purpose? It was to point people to the one who was actually behind Paul and his ministry. You see, through these miracles, God was demonstrating that Paul was sent by him, that he was God's apostle. The word apostle means one who has been sent. The sign that someone was an apostle was the miracles that God did through them. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 12, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, notice this, with signs and wonders and mighty works. You see, during this transitional period of the church, God authenticated or um, validated His apostles through signs and wonders and mighty works, through miracles. Looking back on the apostles' ministry, the writer of Hebrews indicates that miracles were how God actually bore witness of the message of the apostles. He said God also bore witness how? by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. Now, this doesn't say that God bears witness, present tense, as if it's to be an ongoing thing. It says that God bore witness, past tense, by signs, wonders, and miracles. So does this mean that God doesn't heal people today? No, absolutely not. God heals people today if it is His will. However, and this is very important for you to understand, while God heals people today, He doesn't heal through the apostolic gift of healing. Why? Well, very simply, because the apostles are all gone. Therefore, the need for God to authenticate an apostle's ministry through apostolic gifts has passed. God's power may sometimes be expressed by miracles. But there's a second thing we see about God's power in verses 13 through 17. God's power will never be exploited by man. You see... God does not allow people to sort of access His power and exploit it for their own purposes. It's not as if God's power can be, can be um, somehow grabbed onto or, 
or manipulated away from God to be used by people. The miracles that were being done by God through Paul actually became well known in Ephesus. And when, through Paul, God was casting out demons of those who were possessed, there were some who tried to exploit God's power for their own personal benefit. Look at verses 13 and 14. It says, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. And then he had seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. Now here we, we meet a group of itinerant Jewish exorcists in this story. An exorcist is someone who seeks to cast out an evil spirit from people who are possessed by them. These exorcists were, from what we can tell in the text, were Jewish But while they may have been Jewish by ethnicity, they were not Jewish by religion. They were actually sons of a man named Sceva, or Sceva, who Luke says was a Jewish high priest. Now, the Jews kept meticulous records, and according to Jewish records, there's no record of a high priest named Sceva. So either this man had apostatized from Judaism and given himself over to the occult as a high priest of of Artemis, or he was merely claiming to be a high priest in order to give some credibility to his family hustle. His sons saw Paul cast out demons in the name of Jesus, and they thought they would try to harness that power that was operating through Paul. You see, they they viewed Jesus as simply a, a power that they could access and use for their purposes. They didn't see Jesus as God. They didn't believe in Him as Savior. They didn't submit to Him as Lord. They just wanted to borrow His name for a while as a source of power for their own benefit. So they went to this house, a house of a man that everyone knew was demon-possessed. And they said in verse 13, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Now, the word adjure means to command. It means to charge. So what they're doing here is they are attempting to actually command a demon by invoking the name of Jesus. But as we'll see in verses 15 and 16, God's power will not be exploited by man. Because what happened next? Well, it was completely unexpected. Look at verses 15 and 16. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Now this is informative on two levels. It tells us two things about demons. First, it tells us that demons have intellect and they understand to whom they are subject. You see, these men who attempted to cast out this demon out of the man had no clue what they were getting themselves into. And when the demon spoke to them through the mouth of the man that he possessed, I think they were genuinely shocked. Not only did the demon not obey them, they had tried to command him to come out of him, but the demon showed nothing but disdain and contempt for them. Notice what he did. First, the demon acknowledged his creator. He said, Jesus, I know. Listen, demons know Jesus because he created all the angels. Paul says in Colossians 1.16, Referring to Jesus, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Listen, demons know Jesus. They know he's their creator. They even believe that he's God. James 2.19 says, you believe that God is one, you do well. 
even the demons believe and shudder. So the demon acknowledged his creator. He said, Jesus, I know. Then notice, secondly, the demon recognized Paul. He said, Paul, I recognize. Now, the demon didn't recognize Paul simply because he was a believer in Christ. It was because Paul was the apostle of Jesus who had been sent to represent his Lord in Ephesus. And as Jesus' apostle, this demon understood that Paul had been given authority to cast demons out of people through the power of Christ. He said, Paul, I recognize. There's no doubt that the demon world trembled when they saw Paul preaching the gospel because he was a threat to the kingdom of darkness. Jesus, I know. Paul, I recognize. Notice thirdly, the demon now acknowledged the impotence of these men. He said, but who are you? In other words, he was saying to these men, you don't have any power over me whatsoever. You do not know Jesus, and you are not apostles. So who do you guys think you are to try to control me? And then to demonstrate just how impotent these men were, he just, the demon just went off. This leads us to something else that we see about demons. They not only have intellect and understand to whom they are subject. Secondly, demons have power and they understand to whom they are not subject. One of the manifestations of demon possession is extraordinary physical strength. We see this in the Gospels as those who were possessed broke chains and they couldn't be bound And we see it here in the control that this demon demonstrated over these seven men. Luke says that the possessed man leaped on them and then mastered all of them and overpowered them. In other words, one demon took out seven men. He pounced on them like a lion, shredding their clothes and their skin. And he left these men humiliated and wounded and bleeding. And Luke tells us that they ran out of the house into the city naked, which meant that they were ashamed. Listen, no human power, even using the name Jesus, can control a demon. Do you know how God frees demon-possessed people today? He doesn't do it through exorcists. He doesn't do it by believers trying to claim that they can bind Satan and just say the word and cause demons to leave people. No. God frees demon-possessed people through the power of the gospel. Listen, when God opens the dark and depraved heart of any sinner, whether that sinner is possessed by a demon or not, The Holy Spirit then gives that person spiritual life. Jesus redeems that person, and the Holy Spirit takes up residence in that person's life. You see, it's only through the gospel that God changes the heart of a person and delivers him from his bondage to sin and slavery to Satan. So God's power may sometimes be expressed through miracles. It may It will never be exploited by man. And thirdly, in verse 17, we see that God's power will lead to exalting the master. Now, what was the result of God's power being displayed in Ephesus through Paul? Look at verse 17. Luke says, And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Don't you love that? You see, the miracles done through Paul and the incident of these men being overpowered by the demons that they tried to control became known by everyone in Ephesus. And it became known that the Jesus that Paul was proclaiming, 
had more power over the spiritual realm than even the powerful evil spirits. And as a result, Luke says two things happened. First, fear fell upon them all. In other words, the people in Ephesus, Jews and Greeks, were in awe of God. Not only because of the power that was expressed through these miracles being done by Paul, but also because of the kind of life-changing power that was being demonstrated through the gospel. This led to the second thing that happened. Not only did fear come upon all, but the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. This means that it was lifted up. It was magnified. Now everybody in Ephesus knew about Jesus, and they knew about God's servant, the Apostle Paul. And so more and more people came to hear the gospel that Paul was preaching, and Jesus was lifted up and magnified. Isn't that great? Well, in verses 18 through 20, we come to the final scene in this section. Here we see that through the changes in his people, the Lord impacts communities with the gospel. See, everything we've seen to this point is really about assaulting the kingdom of darkness with the spiritual weapons of truth. We've seen the word of God, and we've seen the power of God, and here in this vignette, we see the work of God in believers. And two things emerge about this work. First, The transformation of sinners initiates changes in their lives. So not only did fear fall upon everyone in Ephesus, and not only was the name of the Lord exalted by what was happening in Ephesus, but it initiated a great spiritual awakening in Ephesus that was expressed by repentance. That's what we see in this section. Notice the change of repentance, the change that's brought on by repentance. Verse 18, also many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. I love this. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5 17 that anyone who is in Christ is what? He's a new creation. Old things are past, right? The old is passed away. The new has come. Well, many of those who had been in bondage to sin and enslaved to Satan, who were now believers, were now believers through Paul's ministry. Remember how dark Ephesus was? Well, these people were coming to the light, and everything was changing. And as an expression of the change that had come about in their lives, they came, Luke says, confessing and divulging their former practices. You see, this was more than merely a confession of their former ways. This was not like, you know, coming to an, an AA meeting and they were all saying, Hi, uh, my name is Mike. I'm an alcoholic. It wasn't that kind of confessing. They weren't just merely confessing that, Oh, yeah, I used to be doing this. I used to be doing that. No, this was a commitment of forsaking these sinful practices altogether. This is true repentance. They weren't saying, yes, I was a Satan worshiper, or I am a Satan worshiper. No, they were saying, that was part of my life, and I have forsaken it altogether. It is no longer who I am. You see, those people expressed true repentance Those who come to faith in Christ don't hold on to what's in their past that dishonors God. They don't hold on to those things. They repent of those things. They release those things to God. I love how these new Christians openly confessed and divulged their practices that were part of their old life. They realized they were no longer who they used to be. Just like some of you. You're no longer who you were. That is not your identity. Maybe if you're someone who was in bondage to alcohol or in bondage to drugs, that's not your identity. You are not an alcoholic. You are not a drug abuser unless you are currently still abusing those substances. 
Those of you who were involved in homosexuality or involved in adultery or, or were involved in hom- um, other sexual sins. You are not a homosexual. You are not an adulterer unless that is part of your life now. Those things were part of who you were. When you came to Christ, you forsook those things. And now your pursuit is Jesus Christ. If you are willingly hanging on to some of the same sinfully destructive practices of the past, it may be that you have never been converted. You've never been saved. See, becoming a Christian doesn't mean being perfect, but it does mean that your submission to Christ will be evident in how you deal with your sin. So there's the change of repentance. And as we see in verse 19, there is the cost of repentance. Verse 19 says, And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. Stop right there for a moment. What was happening here? Well, the things that had potential to distract and negatively influence their lives spiritually were voluntarily brought to a common area and they were burned. They were burned. You think, that's odd. Why didn't they just sell these scrolls, which is what the books were? Why didn't they just sell them or at least give them away to others? Why did they have to destroy them? Very simply, it was because these people now belong to Jesus Christ. But these books, these scrolls that were part of their old life, belong to the realm of darkness. I remember the night that I was saved. I spent several hours going through my house. I, I didn't know what happened to me. I just knew that something had died. I was not who I was. And I went through my house and I gathered up everything that I thought would negatively influence me and would dishonor God. Anything that I thought would drag me back to that old life that I felt at that moment I had been freed from. And I ended up filling two large trash cans full of just drug paraphernalia and junk that was no longer part of my life. And to tell you, as I... I took those big trash cans down to the curb. I felt a freedom. I was demonstrating in that moment those things have no power over me. And I was washing my hands of them, burning the ships, so to speak, because I wasn't going back there. That's what these believers were doing. They collectively brought these things out and burned them. And believe me, This was one expensive bonfire. Look at the end of verse 19. It says, And they counted the value of them, that is the value of what they burned, and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. Now that doesn't sound like much to us. I mean, 50,000 pieces of silver? The pieces of silver that they brought were, were drachmas. One drachma, one piece of silver, was the average wage, daily wage, of a laborer. And Luke says that the value then of what they burned was 50,000 days worth of wages. You still don't understand. Let me, let me put this in some perspective so that you, you get this. In the state of Kansas, the average wage for a laborer is $14 an hour. That would be $112 an hour. A day. So what this means is that in today's terms, the value of the books that they burned, the books they destroyed, would be $5.6 million. <laughs> repentance is costly. But the benefit of repentance far outweighs any monetary value. What are you holding on to that's tethering you to your old life before you were saved? What are you you getting through that idol that's better than what you have in Jesus Christ? 
Are you willing to repent and leave those things behind? Listen, I can tell you, Jesus is worth it. So the transformation of sinners initiates changes in their lives. And finally, as we wrap things up in verse 20, the transformation of sinners impacts communities where they live. Coming to Jesus had changed the lives of these believers so much that it completely impacted the city of Ephesus. Verse 20 says, notice this, So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Now Luke doesn't just say that the word of the Lord increased and prevailed. He said it continued to increase and prevail mightily. What this means is that as more and more lives were being changed by the gospel, the gospel continued to expand and capture more territory from Satan. This is huge. And as we see next time, it actually greatly disrupted the whole um, idol-making industry. And the city ended up rioting against what was happening. Well, how... How do you change a community like Ephesus that's in the grip of the enemy? Let's just go through some implications of this as we close. How do you bring about change where Satan has a stronghold? Is it by imposing laws that legislate reform? Is it by social activism? Is it by political change? Many Christians actually believe it is. And we see that today. As more and more churches who claim to be big G gospel type churches are getting away from the gospel and they are looking at social and political solutions for what we see happening. But none of those things were employed in Ephesus. You see, communities are transformed by God as the people in those communities are transformed by God. What this means is that as we as believers live authentic lives that reflect Christ and boldly proclaim the gospel, God reaches people and changes people. America is in the grip of darkness. And we're hearing cries for change in all kinds of arenas. In education, we're hearing cries for change socially, economically, politically. But none of the solutions that are being presented will bring our nation out of the darkness that we're in. You see, our only hope is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He changes people through His Word. And the people then whom He changes take the gospel to the world. There are no shortcuts for lasting transformation. So let me ask you this, Christian. How are you part of the solution? How are you part of the solution? Is your life really any different because of Jesus? Is it? What do you need to surrender to Him? What is still tethering you to your past? Do you know Him? Do you know Him? You can. Through the gospel. Will you trust in Jesus today and be transformed by the power of God? Pray with me. Father, thank you for the opportunity that we've had this morning to look at this passage of Scripture, to learn from you, to be challenged by your Spirit concerning our own lives personally. Pray that you would help us To not just be forgetful hearers, but to be doers 
of the word today and that we would put into practice the things that you have challenged us with. Pray for those who do not know you that right now, this moment, that they would forsake those things they've been trusting in, the things that they've been using to deal with their anxiety and their fear, the things they've been pursuing to provide security and peace, and that they would turn to Jesus Christ forsaking all else and that you would save them. Would you do that in their hearts today? Help us as the church to be bold in reasoning and persuading unbelievers with the truth of the gospel. And would you magnify your name in our community as we follow you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.